Good afternoon. My name is Professor Basim Shaban. I teach world religions at Seminole State College. And this is part of the world religion class project dealing with the topic on drunk driving and alcoholism in the United States. So we have a full schedule for you. And many of our speakers are experts in the field of um, alcoholism and the threat it has on not only young people, but adults in general. So first and foremost, before we introduce our speakers, I want to start off with a video that will get us going about the seriousness of this issue that we're dealing with. Hello. Hi, Mom. Angry. Not like you to call. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to say hello. Oh, all right, that's so funny. It's really noisy and hard to hear you. Are, are you at a party? Dude, we're down. Let's go. Yeah. Right. Hey, uh, Jenny wants to know. Are you going to come on Sunday? Remember, it's Grandpa's birthday. Um, we would love you to be there. I don't think I'll be able to. Really? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Are you out with your uni, mate? Andrew, you are actually doing some studies here, aren't you? Not just partying all the time. Yes, Mum. You keeping on top of your studies? Andrew? Yes, Mum. I've told you before, first year is important. You really need to knuckle down, mate. Yes, Mum. Right. Is Dad there? No, look, it's, it's really hard to hear you, love. He's on his way home. Why? Oh, no reason. Andrew, is something wrong? No, I just wanted to say hi. What's wrong, love? Talk to me. Andrew? And, this water in this car? and I love you, Mum. And, and I love you too, honey. Where are you? <laughs> Andrew, you're really scaring me. <laughs> Andrew, what's that? I can't hear you, Andrew. <laughs> So our topic, for those who just came in, is drunk driving and the seriousness of this uh, social epidemic in our communities. So our first speaker uh, represents uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Ms. Amy Volker. She vol she's a volunteer with MAD, and she speaks to many different groups in order to help fundraise and outreach with the message of the threat of drunk driving. She is uh, professionally an accountant and auditor. She worked for UCF for about 20 years, and she is a proud grandmother and mom. So before we introduce the religious speakers, we're going to give Amy about 20 minutes to introduce us to this topic. So help me welcome Amy Volker to the podium. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for letting me come back today and share. I'm hoping in the next few minutes to accomplish a couple of things. Um, I want to share some facts with you about drunk driving. I want to tell you my personal story and give you some ideas of what you can do if you choose um, as far as making better decisions about drinking and driving. And just to let you know, these are, these are facts about drunk driving. Um, MAD recently changed their mission to include drugged driving as well. So really, when I speak about it, I'm thinking about any time someone's under the influence of anything that affects their mental and motor skills. So that could be prescription drugs, illegal drugs, and or alcohol. So first, the cold hard facts. Uh, 0.08, that is the legal limit for your blood alcohol content in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Essentially what that means is that for every 100 milliliters of your blood, there are eight grams of alcohol. If you're under 21, the legal limit is zero because you're not supposed to legally be drinking. Um, you can get a DUI, driving under the influence, boating under the influence, which unfortunately happens quite a bit in the states with a lot of lakes like Florida. 
um, and things like public intoxication. Every 110 seconds, so just under two minutes every day in the US, someone is injured in a drunk driving crash. That's 290,000 injuries in 2013. The next one is every 52 minutes. So once an hour approximately every day in the US, someone is killed in a driving under the influence crash. That's 10,076 people in 2013. And I happened to look up the enrollment of Seminole State College, you're right around 18,600 students. So to kind of put that in perspective, if that happened just here on campus, or I guess really the campuses of Seminole State College, it's one out of every two people would not be here next year. The DUI deaths are about a third of all vehicle-related deaths in the US. That's for 0.08 and above. If you take into account the 0.01 to 0.08 so any alcohol in the system, it actually rises to 40% of deaths from vehicle crashes. The $199 billion is not the money I have in the bank, unfortunately, although I wish hopefully someone here will one day get there. Um, this is actually the cost every year from drunk driving crashes in the US. This is everything from your increased insurance costs, which affects everybody, even though you may not be involved in the crash, the health expenses, funeral expenses, all of those things that go into repairing lives as best possible after a crash. Male versus female. Um, sorry guys, you're on the losing end of this one. Men are more likely to drive drunk almost two times as likely as females. Ages, again, there are a lot of faces in this room that fall into the category. 21 to 24 year olds are the biggest percentage of drunk drivers at 32 percent. Um, it goes down slightly from there on, but the vast majority of DUIs go to someone between the ages of 21 and 44. And lastly, the a third again and again. Unfortunately, about a third of DUI arrests are for repeat offenders. Someone who's already been arrested convicted or not convicted, but they've had an arrest for DUI and they're back on the street and they do it again and they're rearrested. And just so you know, every time somebody is driving drunk, they don't get stopped. You know, they, they say the average is something like 80 times driving under the influence before you actually will get a DUI. Now there is some good news. Um, I volunteer for MAD. Um, MAD was established in 1980. So in those 35 years, um, efforts of MAD and similar organizations, as well as other safety things related to cars, have actually reduced the annual deaths. They used to be over 20,000 a year, and now we're hovering around the 10,000 mark. Um, another good thing is every state has some type of ignition interlock device law, the thing you have to put on your car and blow in to start it if you've been convicted of a DUI. However, all the states are different. Um, one of the MAD initiatives right now is to get every state to change that law so when you get the first DUI, you have to put in the ignition interlock device. Um, reason being, there have been some studies by other um, traffic safety organizations that show that especially for repeat offenders, that change reduces DUI crashes by 60%. Um, they did a study, I think it was in Arizona, New Mexico, I want to say one of the other states out in that area. You know, the thing about drunk driving is uh, we don't need to find a cure. We actually know what the cure is. The cure is not to drink and drive or drive a boat. Um, actually, there have also been driving golf carts under the influence with um, injuries and deaths. Um, so it's 100% preventable crime. It's more about the social aspects of being able to say, I'm not okay to drive or I need to make a plan before I get out and have a good time. We're not against drinking, we're not against partying, okay, that's not, that's not it, it's just be responsible. 
Um, I want to share with you a few faces, um, mostly from Central Florida, but others I've just kind of come to know as I've volunteered. I'm going to start up here in the corner with the little um, cutie with the little pigtails. Her name is Emma Longstreet. Emma was killed on New Year's Day 2013 when she was on her way to church with her family and a drunk driver hit their van. Um, the ignition interlock law in South Carolina, the first one ever put into place last year, is named Emma's Law after Emma Longstreet. Next is Laura Lamb. In 1979, Laura and her mom were on their way to the grocery store on a Saturday morning when they were hit head on by a repeat offender drunk driver without a valid driver's license who had already had three pints of alcohol and a couple of beers by 11 o'clock in the morning. He hit them head on and Laura became the youngest quadriplegic in the U.S. at five and a half months old. The offender was sentenced to six and a half years and about the time he served his time is how long Laura lived. She died at seven years old from complications from her injuries. Next is Carrie Leitner. In 1980, Carrie was walking with a friend to a um, fair at their neighborhood church when she was hit by a drunk driver. Her mom, Candace Leitner, started Mothers Against Drunk Driving and also has another nonprofit now called We Save Lives with the same mission. She realized that the repeat offender in their case was only going to be sentenced to two years, basically um, halfway house arrest. And that was what really spurred her on to try to get tougher sentencing, especially for repeat offenders. Jeremy Adams is in the corner. He was killed in 2011. And I, I share him because he was actually on his motorcycle. Um, he was being followed by his girlfriend who was driving her car. She was intoxicated. She actually ran over and killed Jeremy and drove several more blocks before she realized he wasn't in front of her any longer. On the bottom is Lauren Dietrio. In 2008, she was on a walk with a friend when she was hit by a repeat offender who actually tried to flee the scene but then hit a telephone pole, which stopped her long enough for authorities to get there and arrest her. Um, the next is Devon Alicia. Um, his mom and I speak a lot here in Central Florida. In 2009, Devon went out with a friend. Um, his friend was drunk. His friend was driving. Devon was sober and his friend went off the road and hit a pole and killed Devon. Um, their trial ended last year and he was sentenced to jail. Um, next is Jamari Cook and Rachel Price. They were students from the Central Florida area. They were going off back to college together, like traveling you know, back to the spring semester when an alleged drunk driver hit and killed them both. Um, their trial is still ongoing. Um, why I use the word allegedly, um, he did have the high blood alcohol content. And last, Crystal Fisher. Um, in 2005, she was killed along with her friend Bethany. Um, they were in the car with a friend who was drunk. Um, he had an accident crash. They were both killed. And when the police got there, he was standing behind, beside the car telling them that he'd killed his two best friends. So this is why I care. Um, this is a picture from 2009. Um, my son, Kelly, is there graduating from high school in the middle. Um, he was in the International Baccalaureate program, so he has kind of, you know, a little bit of bling on. My husband, his dad, Roy, is in the back, and my stepsons, Roy's sons, are on either side. Um, Nathan's in the blue, and Roy the third is in the pink shirt. Roy and I raised his boys, um, then added Kelly, and we had a whole life of a lot of boy stuff. Um, if you have brothers and sisters, you can probably understand that better than me. I was an um, only child, and so it was a little bit of a learning experience, I can tell you, as a parent. Um, but lots of fun. And when we had this graduation, it was the first time in a couple years we'd all been together. Um, Roy had gone to college in Louisiana, met a young lady there, gotten married, so we didn't see him as often. And we decided we would plan a, for the following summer, you know, a big family get together. Um, Kelly was going off to school at University of Miami, and so, you know, we knew it'd be that transition to where, you know, the kids were all gonna be around less and less. So in July 2010, we rented a beach house over at Reddington Beach, which is near St. Pete on the west coast of Florida. We were celebrating Kelly's 19th birthday on Friday. Got him a big cookie cake that we devoured. 
So it was my husband and I, Kelly and his girlfriend, Celine, um, Roy and his wife, Sandy, and they had a four-month-old son, Roy Four, and Nathan and his wife and their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Kayla. Uh, Saturday was beach day. We spent a lot of time out having fun, playing with the grandkids, splashing. Um, there was a whole incident with filling the baby pool and dumping it on the girls and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. And fixed dinner together, and the guys had all said, leading up to this vacation, that they wanted to kind of do something, just the four of them. And they decided they would just go to a late movie, and we would stay and watch a DVD and put the, girls, the kids to bed. And so they took off to go see the movie. That same Saturday, um, in another part of St. Pete, the 20-year-old, Demetrius Jordan, he had kind of grabbed his cousin for the day, and they'd been hanging out. They went over to girlfriend's house to hang out with the girls. Um, they were drinking mixed drinks and Four Locos, which at the time was a highly caffeinated beer. It's actually a very cheap beer. Um, since then, the caffeine's been removed for other lawsuit reasons. And about sometime after midnight, um, Demetrius and his cousin decided they would leave the girl's house. Demetrius was driving. They were driving down a four-lane undivided road in St. Pete the speed limit's 35 miles an hour. He was going from 85 to 90 on that road and blowing through the stoplights, according to witnesses, when he tried to run the light at 9th Street and 22nd Avenue. My husband was driving himself and my sons back to the beach house from the movie on 22nd Avenue on the green light. That's a picture of our car from that night. Demetrius hit it square on the passenger side where my son Kelly was in the front and Nathan was in the back. He shoved the car across the intersection up over the curb and the force of it threw our car up into the steel pole that's at the 7-Eleven there with the gas prices. Um, on the far side of the car there's a pole sized dent where my husband was sitting as the driver. And because of those decisions and in that split moment of time my husband of 20 years and my 19-year-old son and my 24 and 28-year-old stepsons were killed instantly in this crash. Demetrius' cousin was seriously hurt. Um, I know he was released from the hospital in a wheelchair. I don't know his current condition. Demetrius hurt his foot and ankle. Um, he was taken to the hospital where he was then arrested for four counts of DUI manslaughter. He was not released on bond, his parents couldn't afford it. And so for the next two years, as we went through the trial process, he was in jail, awaiting his sentencing. And I have to say, when we went to go to trial, I was glad that he had whatever change of heart he had, because instead of going through a trial, the morning of trial, he changed his plea to guilty. And at that point, the judge had to sentence him under Florida law, and he was sentenced to 44 years in prison for four counts of DUI manslaughter. He was not charged for anything for the injuries to his cousin. He has to serve 85% of that sentence, um, so he will be there until his 50s. And I'd like to say the little things I know about him. Um, you know, he went to high school, he graduated from high school, he was in community college, he taught drums to kids because he'd been a drummer in high school, you know, he lived at home. This was not a kid who was really a super troubled kid. Um, but he was, the family said, using alcohol and pot to make himself feel better um, after the recent death of his grandmother and making some really poor decisions. And unfortunately, that one moment of poor decision had a very large ripple effect. Um, you know, my two grandchildren lost their dads. Um, I lost my husband and my sons, my family, it's just gone. Um, everyone deals with grief very differently and so there were ripple effects through the rest of the family and through friendships. And it's, you know, it's not an easy road. Um, that's why I like to come and talk and share our story, even though it's difficult, because I really don't want anyone else to be anywhere near the same position. You know, I want you, everyone to survive and be healthy and whole. Um, just a few facts, and I know I think the class has had some of these up too. Um, just make a plan before you go out, whatever that is. You're staying at the friend's house overnight. 
you know, you can sleep in your car somewhere, um, taxi, Uber, Lyft. There's another one called Be My DD. And in some parts of, the, um, not in Orlando, but in other parts of the state and other states, there's a, one called Steer Clear. They come and pick you up. There are some that will come and pick you up with your car, so your car gets home with you, which I know is often kind of a deal breaker when people make that decision to get in their car and drive. Um, share how you feel about this with others. I know of at least one story where I've talked to offenders and a young lady was moved and she started telling others and the story actually came back to me through another mom who had lost her son in another crash. So that really does help spreading the word. Um, talk to kids in your life. Um, MAD calls April 21st Power 21 Day. At MAD.org you can get free things to talk to middle school or high school kids in your life or share with your families. Um, you can download the materials and it just kind of helps parents know kind of the outline of how to get to the point when they don't really know how to have this uncomfortable conversation. Um, as sometimes we have many uncomfortable conversations to have with our kids. And lastly, I just want to um, ask you to treat others with compassion. You, people are not always aware of the hidden hurts in your life. I know whenever I share this story, it's not unusual for someone to tell me that they know someone who's been in a drunk driving crash or they've lost a child in another way. Um, you know, we carry a lot of things inside us that people don't know about. And so just, you know, as you go through your life, think about that when people maybe react funny or they, you know, you have kind of a weird feeling about somebody, you know, just don't assume. Try to just take that high road and say, you know, maybe they're suffering and you just don't know what it is. Okay. So now I'm going to hand it over to Rabbi Kay. So let me first introduce our religious speakers. I want to thank Amy for her bravery and her story, uh, something that we can definitely learn from. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers together uh, before uh, we start with uh, the first. Rabbi Kay, Rabbi, Rabbi David Kay is a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, where he received both rabbinic ordination and a master's of arts degree in Jewish education. He serves congregation Ohev Shalom in Maitland, born and raised in Chicago. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Ecology, Ethology, and Evolution from the University of Illinois. After college, he worked in various jobs, ranging from biological research technician to preschool teacher, before returning to his teenage vision of becoming a rabbi. During the ne nearly 20 years between graduating college and entering rabbinical school, he played music solo with a collaborative and an original band. He returned to the organized Jewish community through involvement in the synagogue of the deaf in suburban Chicago. Always passionate about civil rights and social justice, Rabbi Kay has been engaged in interfaith activities, including the Catholic Jewish Dialogue Group of Collier County, Florida, and the Interfaith Council of Central Florida through which he has been honored to help coordinate the annual interfaith observance of Martin Luther King. Our next speaker is Pastor James Coffin. He's executive director of the Interfaith Council of Central Florida, brings to his current role a diverse life experience. Mr. Coffin grew up on a farm in Missouri. After graduating from high school, he spent a year as a church volunteer in Mexico. He subsequently he earned a degree in theolo theology at New Bold College in England and was later ordained as a minister for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. During his ministerial career, he worked in both the United States for 26 years and Australia for 10 years. In addition to residing overseas for extended periods, he has traveled extensively in Europe, Asia, and the South Pacific. Pastor Coffin spent nine years of his pastoral work in youth ministry and nine years as an editor of the Adventist Church publication. His last 18 years be before assuming his, role, his current role, he served as senior pastor of the Markdom Wood Church of Seventh-day Adventist in Longwood. He has authored three books dealing with the theory about practice of and questions arising from religion. He has written scores of articles for religious publications and websites, 
and he has had some 50 My Word Opinion pieces printed in the Orlando Sentinel, usually addressing religious and social ethical issues. He and his Australian wife have been married for 36 years and have three grown sons. Last but not least is Imam Muhammad Musri. He's the president and senior imam of the Islamic Society of Central Florida, which includes 10 mosques, a full-time school, K-1 K through 12, a child care center, a social services organization, and an interfaith outreach department, which provides hospital and prison chaplains and partners with various faith communities to pro promote peace and respect among all people. He served for four years as the co-chair of the Interfaith Council of Central Florida. Imam Musri has a weekly radio station called The Three Wise Guys with Rabbi Ingle and Reverend Fulwider. So he's one of the three wise guys and is regularly interviewed by local national and international TV, radio, and print media. Imam Musri is a regular lecturer on Islam Islamic law and the culture of the Middle East as, at various colleges and universities. He was first appointed by Governor Jeb Bush as a member of the Florida Governor's Faith-Based faith Advisory Council and was reappointed by Governor Charlie Crist as well as for the Governor's Complete Count Committee for the 2010 Census for the State of Florida. So help me welcome all of our speakers and we'll have Rabbi Kay join us. Be here and uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, uh, since we're uh, since we're all in college, um, uh, I'm going to start with a physics lesson. Oh, sorry, um, but uh, uh, imagine if you have a uh, uh, one-ton piece of metal which is traveling at 55 miles per hour. Um, now you have mass and acceleration. Uh, that, that gives you an idea of just how much force is being generated when you're driving an automobile. Um, fortunately, I took, uh, um, I took a year of physics in high school uh, before I got my driver's license. And uh, um, uh, once I did that calculation and saw how much force there was and, and how much I would have to stop and how much I have to steer through the streets of Chicago, um, I did get my license. It didn't scare me away from my license, but it, it, it turned me into a very cautious driver uh, because I realized exactly what it was that I was moving through groups of people. Yeah, there were other people who were surrounded by walls of metal too, um, but I knew roughly what the, the tolerances of those pieces of metal were, um, and the first time that I, you know, that I backed into a pole in a, in a parking lot um, and saw what going seven miles per hour and just gently bumping something, what it could do um, to, the, uh, um, to the trunk of my parents' car, um, uh, that was not very much force at all. The other one wasn't even moving, right? So. Uh, it was really, and, and it was really driven home to me. I had only been driving about a year, and I was uh, going down the street, just pulled away from uh, my own house, and uh, it just so happened that we parked on the wrong side of the street, facing the wrong way, really, in front of our house, but the way I came in, everybody just did that habitually. So I was pulling away from the curb, and um, this is how long ago it was that I was doing this. The car didn't have an FM radio. Um, so I had a portable radio sitting on the passenger seat, and uh, um, as I was pulling away from the curb, I bumped the antenna. That's really how long ago it was. Um, and so I, I leaned over to adjust it for just a split second. And when that happened, um, I veered to the right. And the right front corner of my parents' car bumped, and I was going less than 10 miles an hour, bumped in the middle of the radiator of a neighbor's car and caved it in. Um, uh, and uh, at that point, I said to myself, um, uh, I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm driving a vehicle uh, and I'm not in full possession of my judgment, uh, because that was pretty poor judgment to begin with. And you can imagine if, uh, you know, if you further impaired that poor judgment that I, I would really be dangerous on the road. Um, I want to address this topic from the perspective of my faith tradition. And w one of the overarching principles in Judaism, uh, in Hebrew is called pikuach nefesh. It means the, the, the preservation of life. Uh, and that's an overarching concept in, in every faith tradition, is the, 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 cent the centrality, this, the, the, sanct the sanctity of life. Um, 
uh, how that plays out is going to be more or less the same in, uh, um, I think, in, you know, in, in every faith tradition and philosophy, um, that, that we don't devalue human life. Um, but let me just give you a few, a few specifics, and then I, um, uh, um, I have a closing point I'd like to make as well. Uh, the first one is the question of alcohol to begin with. Uh, okay, there, uh, mine is not a tradition which says that, uh, um, that alcohol is something that you abstain from. Um, in fact, there is a, uh, there's a rabbinic teaching, there's a Talmudic teaching that says um, the best way to celebrate something uh, is to have wine uh, because wine gladdens the heart. But um, you have to put that in its historic context. Wine in the ancient usage could be anything from kind of what we know as wine today, although most wines, by the way, and even though they have a comparatively low alcoholic content compared to, uh, uh, compared to distilled alcohol, uh, most wines have been needled. That means uh, if they have a 10, 11% alcohol content, that's because alcohol's been added to them. Um, so in the ancient world, you had wine that was maybe 6 or 7% alcohol by volume, um, kind of where uh, many beers are. Um, but it ranged everything from what was called new wine, which was essentially grape juice, um, to fermented wine, which was then, uh, uh, which was then uh, uh, diluted with water because it had a very strong flavor. It wasn't, hum you know, we didn't go through all the processing. It wasn't filtered and all that kind of stuff. Um, so even though, yes, the Bible says that wine, uh, uh, and by the Bible, I mean the Hebrew Bible, uh, gladdens your heart, um, that doesn't mean you're supposed to drink um, or the, at all necessarily or certainly not to excess. Uh, because set against that is the, the tradition, a very strong biblical tradition, um, of preserving and protecting and defending your personal health. Um, and it was known in the ancient world, and we certainly know today, we certainly document it, the, the, the physical, be, setting aside for a moment the issue of impaired driving um, or boating or, or ski-doing or whatever else he happens to be doing, um, there's the, the, the health impact on you, right? I mean, if you stop to think about it, something which, you know, you know, which makes you dizzy and impairs your judgment um, is probably not necessarily something which is good for you physically um, uh, um, when, you, when you stop to think about it. I mean, if you just got out of bed one day and you said, man, I feel really dizzy and guilty and I'm making bad decisions, um, uh, you would figure <coughs> that you must be sick and you need something to, you know, you need to go back to bed, um, not, you know, let's jump in the car and get, pick up my friends. Um, the other concept that I want to touch on, though, is uh, um, one which is emphasized again and again in the Torah, the primary sacred text in Judaism, um, which is the responsibility that we have for the consequences of our actions. Um, we are held accountable, um, according to Jewish tradition, uh, to what, for whatever it is that we do. Um, and the rabbinic tradition that comes later uh, actually expands on this. And there's a teaching that says, if you Whatever it is that you do, you're responsible for the consequences, whether you intended it or not, whether you were awake or asleep. Right? So think about it. If you're sleeping and you know, your arm flings out and you knock over, uh, um, let's go to the ancient world, you knock over a candle and you start a fire. No, you didn't deliberately start a fire, but the fire started because of something that happened through you. You have some level of responsibility. And that's the, uh, um, that's the thing which is, which is emphasized. Um, so whatever it is that you choose to do, you're not just choosing for yourself. You're choosing for others as well. And that brings me to, uh, um, to the last concept I wanted to touch on, which is uh, that of the responsibility of so-called bystanders. I um, mean, people say, you know, I, you know what, can I do? what can I do to stop this? Um, or I couldn't do anything to stop it. Yeah, you probably could. You have responsibility too. Just because it isn't you doing it doesn't mean you don't have an obligation um, to be part of that. Uh, and that includes those people who serve the alcohol. Um, you know, if I'm selling drinks at the bar, and I've, you know, at, in my band days, I tended bar as well. Um, if I'm playing drinks at the bar, yeah, I want to sell as many of those as I can. But it, I also have a responsibility. These days, I have a, a legal liability. But even back in those days, I have a responsibility to think about how is this guy getting home? This guy is completely wrecked. And he comes back, and he wants more drinks. So, you know, either I sell him enough that he can't stand up at all, um, or I have to say to myself, buddy, how are you getting home? Because you're not getting into your car. And even if I don't have a legal responsibility or a, uh, um, 
a, a liability responsibility because I don't want to get sued. I've got an ethical and a moral responsibility to say, give me the keys and we'll make sure somebody gets you home. Um, okay, so um, something which uh, um, in, in Amy's presentation which was very touching and I appreciate and, and thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your personal story with us. Um, uh, something which struck me um, and it's always in the back of my mind and I haven't said in public but now I think it's a good thing to close with um, is that I think we all look forward to the day um, when we don't have to name any more laws um, after the victims of uh, whatever it is that people did. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you. If, uh, if I were to ask how many of you expect to be arrested for a DUI, probably not many of you are going to raise your hand and say, oh, yes, I, uh, I plan to do that tonight or uh, <laughs> next week or whatever it might be. And if I were to ask you how many of you expect to do something really horrendous while under the influence, uh, probably nobody's going to raise their hand and say, yeah, certainly, you know, it's, uh, you know, it may be next week or next year, but uh, definitely I will do something under the influence that's really horrendous. Uh, most, most people don't expect, they don't anticipate that that kind of thing would happen to them. And, um, and the, that's one of the big problems we have with drinking is that we always look to the other person. They're the one who has the problem. They're the one who is the one without control over the problem. And so they're the one who's going to have the difficulty, but it's not me. And uh, I grew up in a, uh, in a faith tradition of total abstinence from alcohol. And, um, and so I've never been a, never been a drinker. And so in a sense that disqualifies me to speak and yet on the other hand it empowers me to speak from a different perspective. And uh, one of the things that has hit me is just the number of people I've had to deal with who never expected that alcohol would play the role in their life that it's played. And so Amy's story was as bad as it gets. I mean you can't imagine a scenario worse than that. But. Uh, there are lots of other scenarios that come from the abuse of alcohol that uh, are equally, uh, no, let me back up. No, not equally devastating, but are definitely devastating nonetheless. I remember one day I was uh, standing up, I was in Australia at the time, and my congregation standing up preaching and this really beautiful, beautiful woman walked in. And uh, she had three little children with her who were immaculately dressed. She was immaculately dressed. I'd never seen her before. And she came in and sat with the children, and they were perfectly behaved. And, uh, and afterwards, she said, could I talk to you for a bit? And I said, sure. And she said, I've just left my husband today. And I said, oh, really? What's the problem? And she said, alcohol. And I said, well, what? You know, does he beat you? Oh, no. No, he doesn't beat me. And I said, well, then what's the problem? And she said, well, every Friday afternoon he goes to the pub. And he drinks until he passes out, literally. And his friends haul him here. They dump him off. And then it's my responsibility to take care of him all weekend. And she said, I'm tired of changing the dirty underwear you know, of somebody who comes home and messes his pants every weekend. And she said, I'm not putting up with it anymore. Now, I can assure you that that guy never anticipated. He never said, you know, when I turn 28 years old or I turn 32 years old, I'm going to get drunk every weekend and I'm going to mess my pants and I hope I have a wife who's going to clean me up and uh, all this kind of thing. You know, you don't anticipate that sort of thing. So none of us anticipate the negative, the negative actions that can come from our decisions. And uh, the difficulty with alcohol is that one in every eight persons who takes the first drink becomes a problem drinker. And we don't know who those people are. We haven't been able to, uh, we haven't been able to work it out ahead of time and say, well, now it's going to be you and you and you and you. The rest of you are okay. We don't know. And so we're all kind of playing a form of Russian roulette. And then to make it even more complicated, it doesn't necessarily manifest itself immediately. I may be able to control my alcohol for 10 years or 20 years or 40 years, and then life circumstances change, and maybe my metabolism changes and so on, and suddenly 
it's got control of me. And uh, so what, we, uh, what we're dealing with in drunk driving is kind of a big manifestation of something that happens in a smaller way in life leading up to that sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to tell you a joke, and uh, I'm telling you the joke because I don't think you should tell a joke like this, okay? Uh, it's a, supposedly a true story. It happened in Australia, at least that's where I heard about it, and Australians do tend to be pretty heavy drinkers. And so uh, one night there's a pub out in the country, and it um, comes time for the pub to sort of start winding down, and very early on, very early on, there's a guy who comes staggering out, and he is clearly under the influence, you know, his gait is unsteady, and uh, he goes to several different cars and he tries to put his key in, and uh, it doesn't work, and there just happens to be a police officer who's watching him, and he says, okay, I'm going to get this guy when he, uh, when he drives away, and in the meantime, someone else comes out and gets in the car and drives away, and someone else, and this guy wanders around, and finally he gets his car door open, and he puts the car in reverse and he backs up a little bit and bumps the car behind him just gently and then he pulls forward and bumps the car ahead of him and while all of this is going on, while all of this is going on, the, uh, the uh, cop is watching it and he says, you know, this guy really is in a bad way. Finally, it's the last car there and he pulls out on the road and starts to drive away and the cop pulls him over and stops him and says, uh, I'm going to ticket you for, for being under the influence and the guy says, I'm not under the influence. And he said, well, I watched you in the, he said, well, you can test me. You can do the breathalyzer. You can do blood, whatever you want. I'm not under the influence. And the, the cop said, how could you be so sure? And he said, because I was the designated decoy. <laughs> so all the other people could get away. And we tell a joke like that because we have ways of kind of diminishing the significance. You know, by, by telling the joke, we can look at it lightheartedly and we can say, oh, it's not really that big a thing. So today we're talking about drunk driving, but we're really talking about a whole package of behavior that comes as a result of the misuse of alcohol. And I'm not uh, saying that everybody needs to be a teetotaler like I am. I'm not uh, trying to demand that. But I do believe that everyone needs to be thinking carefully about what they do. And I'd just like to kind of build on what Rabbi Kay said, everything we do, every decision we make affects us individually. So how much do you value yourself? But that's only part of the picture because everything we do not only affects us individually, but it affects us collectively. And Amy is an example of that collective impact. Okay, someone made a decision that affected him individually, but it affected those around as well. And it's not just the victim's family, okay, but it's also his family. They don't want him to be in prison like that. That's not the vision they had for him. So what happens to us affects us individually, it affects us collectively, but it also affects us cumulatively. And that means that it carries on from generation to generation because here are grandchildren, or here are children, I should say, who don't have a father. Okay, because of a decision somebody else made. And so that takes it to a next generation. And then growing up without a father, what kind of impact does that have on them? And so it's a ripple that keeps going. And when we pause to think about that, our actions affect us individually, they affect us collectively, and they affect us cumulatively, we really need to take seriously what we're doing for our own benefit, for the benefit of those around us, and for the benefit of those who come after us. Having me here, I want to say, like uh, my friend Jim here said, I'm disqualified to talk about this since I have zero experience drinking and driving. Um, because in, in Islam, as it is in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, tradition, um, Alcohol consumption is totally forbidden. It is absolutely uh, not allowed for any purpose, for any reason, for celebration, for um, making it. The Quran is clear that uh, there is no time or place for alcohol consumption. It's, uh, 
It's why 1.6 billion people really don't drink. We don't make it, we don't sell it, we don't transport it. Uh, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that uh, four are cursed, those who make it, those who sell it, those who buy it, and those who transport it. So we stay away from it completely. So in that respect, I'm disqualified to talk about drinking and driving, but uh, the cost of it is something that we all pay for as a society. And as Amy illustrated for us in her personal, very personal story, the loss of her husband and three children, uh, her husband wasn't drunk, nor were her, her children. Uh, and they were the innocent victims of someone who, again, did not intend to go out and slaughter four people that night, but that's the cost of this uh, habit. And as Jim said, when we start at some age drinking small amounts, at some point in our life it may trigger uh, addiction to the point that we become binge drinkers and we may end up causing harm to others, including to our uh, most beloved people around us. The example he used of the young beautiful lady with the three children, breaking that marriage, there are many marriages uh, damaged by alcohol consumption and that's a social cost. Children growing up without their parents or their father or mother because of drinking is a huge cost. Now, the cost on the system that we all pay for the policing, the courts, the prisons, uh, to try to deal with the effects of drinking and driving. You know, even though I never had uh, a drop of alcohol in my life, but I'm paying all of my life through taxes to deal with this problem, which I prefer not to pay for, okay? so. I wish those who drink and drive can only affect themselves, but they affect all of us. They affect all life. So that's why we become all interested in this topic. Now, I know that uh, we heard shocking numbers already, but I want to share with you some more. So from drinkinganddriving.org, they said, since 9-11, we had 140,000 men, women, and children died in the U.S. because of this. Imagine how many laws we made after 9-11. How much inconvenience we have at airports and in public places we are searched because we don't want 9-11 to be repeated. How many billions of dollars we invested in changing our security apparatus to deal with the loss of 3,000 precious lives. What about 140,000 lives? Is that incentive enough to enact laws to say enough is enough? These women and children, these men are the family of somebody all around us, just like Amy's. And I believe uh, if we compare this if we were at war with another nation and we lost 140,000 people in the last 14 years, what would we do? But because these things are happening quietly every day, every few seconds, we feel that this is just normal part of life. It's not. It's not that this is some disease we cannot control. This is something we do by choice. You know, I understand that people die from, you know, diseases that we are trying to prevent, but this is 100% preventable, as Amy said earlier. It's choices we are making. Now, take it worldwide. Every year, the World Health Organization says 3.3 million people die 
because of alcohol. I mean, I haven't seen anywhere anything to tell me there is something positive, useful about alcohol consumption, except people enjoying drinking, but at such a huge cost. If this was a medicine, we would recall it. If this was a food, we will take it out of the market. If, it, if this was anything else, but it seems that we all surrender to the fact that it's part of our lives we just drink under the idea of drinking responsibly. I don't believe there is something called drinking responsibly. Anyone who drinks is being irresponsible. 320,000 young people aged 15 <coughs> to 29 right, <coughs> die annually because of alcohol. That's preventable, completely preventable. So it is the world's third largest risk factor for disease burden also because it also, uh, when combined with other factors, it complicates things much more. And notice that it is in the Western Pacific, the Americas, and the second largest in Europe. So this is not in poor countries. This is not in underdeveloped part of the world. It is right here in our backyard. Now, harmful alcohol use is one of four common risk factors along with tobacco use, poor diet, and physical inactivity. This is, uh, my wife is a doctor, and as uh, the story of Jim went, every weekend uh, she used to have to deal with people who are drunk in the emergency room, and then said, I'm not working anymore. I'm not gonna do my job just all my life trying to fix people that come drunk on the weekend, and then they go to get drunk again. So she changed her entire schedule to only weekdays. And harmful costs, you know, in addition to health costs, uh, there are economic costs to alcohol, and this is from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, that excessive drinking cost the U.S. $223.5 billion annual. So imagine that money, where, what we could do with it in terms of education, health care, or other things. So you could go to the World Health Organization, read their report on the various costs of alcohol consumption. So I wanna say is let's not just focus only on the narrow drinking and driving, let's focus on the real problem, the overall problem, because that is, there are many other issues all related to this. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions? We'll open it to questions now. Anybody write any questions on the index cards? Or you guys all feel that you, like you're experts in the field now? Any questions from the floor? Go ahead. Um, but actually, I'm glad you asked because there's an initiative um, with a couple of different organizations, including MAD. It's actually called DADS, D-A-D-S-S, -S, which I think is kind of neat. Um, and I can't remember now exactly what the acronym is. But it's essentially a detection device that would be built into all new cars. They're in the testing phase now. So you wouldn't have to actually blow into a tube, just your breath and your touch could be measured to make sure that you weren't above the 0.08 and the car would then start. So if you were, I think even sitting in the passenger seat, you know, if you were at least in the front seat, you would have to both be sober enough to start the car. Now, granted, can you still get somebody to start the car and they jump out and somebody else jumps in and 
Yeah, but then you're back to the social issue of we all need to try to help other people realize when they're not making a good decision to try to get in between them and them creating their own disaster. And you know, and that's just you know, it's it's horrible. Um, and in the last few months of the cases I've seen in the news, there have been several parents who've caused the crash that has killed one or more of their children. And I, you know, I just can't imagine how you get to that point in your decision making, even after drinking, where you would think that would be okay. Um, but yeah, so there's they're trying to get the technology improved, but also mass produced. For offenders, for or especially repeat offenders, yeah, that would be that. right. Right. Um, we, we, we tried banning alcohol in the United States. Uh, it didn't go well. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we, a we, lot of people got rich selling it. Of, yes. <laughs> and we, we actually, that was uh, what allowed organized crime to get a, a strong foothold um, in a lot of different areas. So um, uh, it's very clear that this is a country, uh, uh, I used to say this when I was younger, and I'll, I'll, I'll trot this out because it's, it's kind of controversial. Um, I mean, you know, we are an alcoholic country. Um, you know, we are, we are addicted to alcohol just like we're addicted to, you know, to petroleum, just like we're addicted to the internet. All right, there's a, there's a lot of things out there that we just decided we can't live without. Um, uh, and, I, you know, it's, it's no accident. I mean, think of the federal agency who's responsible for the regulation of alcohol. It's the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. All right, three very dangerous, potentially fatal things. Um, they're all together in the same agency. What does that tell you? You know, I mean, we, we, we know what the dangers are. We've always known what the dangers are. And um, uh, we've been reticent to regulate it too strongly because that's an imposition on our freedom. Um, but on the other hand, um, I mean, as, as, uh, as Imam Musri pointed out, you know, we're more than willing to invest huge amounts of resources um, in something which you know, might happen on an outside chance, maybe, perhaps, if somebody was really, really out there. All right. um, uh, so I think the, the, the difficulty is what we're talking about here is changing a culture. Um, and until such time as um, uh, the Super Bowl, you know, is being sponsored uh, by, you know, I don't know, you know, by Dasani Water um, and not by Anheuser-Busch, um, uh, you know, until it's less romantic, until it's, uh, really until the, there's a, sort of a, a, a cultural shift, a paradigm shift like there was with tobacco. Um, and that required somebody to do a lot of digging. Um, it required a populist movement that said, you've known what this does for a really long time. We're not telling you to go out of business, but we're telling you that we're holding you responsible for what you're doing. Um, you're making a lot of money. And by the way, 
Um, the tobacco industry, you notice the tobacco industry in the United States um, has not disappeared as a result. Um, that's because it's all gone overseas. Um, uh, and where countries overseas, and I don't want to shift this to tobacco, but <laughs> when countries overseas have tried to pass laws for labeling, um, they have been sued by American tobacco producers, um, and those little countries can't afford to defend themselves. So they've had to repeal their, their, their packaging warning laws. Um, so that, you know, we can stand tough here, but the issue is a human one. It's a cultural one. Um, and changing culture is probably the most difficult thing you can possibly do. I think there's some, um, uh, you know, I, I do believe that, um, you know, the, the, the campaign saying don't drink and drive um, is already conceding some ground. It's saying drink, but don't drive after you drink. Um, drinking's okay as long as you don't get in a car or you don't get, don't get behind the wheel. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if that, I mean, as a parent, that doesn't seem to me to be an effective way of, of setting limits. Right. I mean, we're not we're not we're not going to get to the, the statistics on domestic on domestic violence and alcohol. Or just or just if. literally falling down drunk. Right. Right. I mean, people are in the emergency room falling down drunk. Um, you know, I think I, I agree. I wish we could just say, just don't. You know, don't abuse alcohol. I think the the soft sell, if you will, of the don't drink and drive is to get us at least somewhere. Um, and you know. There have been improvements since the 70s when it was very socially acceptable. I mean, super socially acceptable. But I can't say all the states are the same. You know, I talk to parents who've lost kids who live, especially in like the Wisconsin middle north, and you know, they don't prosecute there. Oh, well, they didn't mean it. I mean, there, it's a very low arrest and prosecution record. So it's, um, it's a tough one. But it's, I mean, I think it's totally, totally the socially it's so socially acceptable, and how do you switch that around? But, but I do believe that we have seen within society numerous trends that have changed, um, you know, where things just aren't the way they used to be. I mean, we don't, we don't tell uh, chauvinistic jokes as much as we used to because it's just not socially acceptable. Um, we, and, and I believe that, uh, you know, in, increasingly, there's a recognition that at events you need to have non-alcoholic alternatives, mm -hmm. you know. So you're not depriving anybody of their alcohol, but non-alcoholic uh, alternatives. Even vegetarianism is the same kind of thing. It used to be that was way out there. Now the idea that you ask for you ask for a vegetarian alternative, and it's like, yeah, that's within the realm of humanity at least, you know. And uh, and these things are slow to come, but one of the reasons that I don't drink is that. I want to be there for the person who really can't afford to drink. And when I say can't afford to, because they can't control it well. So the fact that I'm not drinking doesn't make him or her look out of place because they're not drinking. And, uh, and, and it only takes a relatively small percentage, you know, 10%, 15% who choose not to drink, who make it much more comfortable for people who are kind of, well, I'd really rather not drink, but I don't want to look weird. And, uh, and so we create you know, the, the freedom to, uh, for them to make a decision. And they don't have to make the decision my way, but if I, I want to give them that option. I want to say that uh, no amount of laws and policing can really uh, stop someone who wants to drink and then, or stop someone who is drunk from driving. Uh, the statistics have shown over the several decades that the problem is not going away. Only internal policing, if you have that will to say, I'm not going to drink, period. That's the only way this can stop. So we're not advocating uh, the US change its laws like the prohibition in the back in the 1920s, but to really 
bring a strong culture to say this is something uh, abhorrent, this is something negative, something we don't look favorably on, not celebrate it as, you know, uh, Rabbi K said, you know, if you watch it on the Super Bowl in the ads, we are all paying for it and saying it's, it's something good, but it's not. We have to call it as it is. It's an evil that is plaguing our society. So as a religious leader, I say the purpose of faith, the purf purpose of religion is to give you certain strong beliefs that say there is no amount of money in the world you can pay me to make me drink an ounce of alcohol. Okay? There is no purpose for it. That's religious conviction. Laws don't make you, you know, there are times when you can get away doing what you want outside the law. But knowing that this is who you are, these are your principles and values, God is always watching, you will not, you know, drink no matter what. And that's what, we, what I would advocate is uh, you don't have to accept my religion, but accept this part of religion that is really in many religions, in Christianity and, and Judaism, uh, there's a lot of people who say, we don't drink, period. And, and that's what I think is the good part of religion that we need to bring back. So I had a question on um, what does the panelists feel is the, if there's even a difference between the legalization of alcohol and the potential legalization of recreational marijuana? For, for us in Islam, any, any drug that intoxicates your mind, takes away your ability to think clearly at all times, is prohibited. It doesn't matter what name, what label, how it is in liquid form or powder form. It is because uh, the human being is uh, gifted with the mind to be able to make good decisions. And once you cloud that mind and take away the ability to make clear decisions, that substance, regardless of what it is, what name it has, is prohibited. I, I just personally would add, I feel very strongly, um, not necessarily legalization, but just um, marijuana in particular, um, our middle son, Nathan, um, I watched him go from a very smart, wonderful child into a middle schooler who found alcohol and marijuana and literally became a changed person um, in many ways and all because, you know, his brain just started being different. And um, luckily he got past some of that, but um, it was a permanent change to him. And so I just feel very strongly that you need to be very careful whatever you put in your body. Um, being someone you know, who could lose a few pounds, I've got the whole food issue, I recognize that. Um, but there are a lot of things you just need to be really super careful. Um, I mentioned you know, in our story it involved four locos. Um, the reason it's not so caffeinated anymore is because it was actually killing college students. It was giving them heart attacks at age 20 and 22. And the lawsuits came out, and they had to change what was in that beer. Um, so just you know, think about your body and what goes in, no matter what it is. Um, but yeah, I have to say I'm I'm the vote no. On. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, there's, there's there's a lot of layers to that issue, and um, one of them is the number of uh, um, is is the way the laws have come down. Um, the way criminalization of marijuana has been handled, and that this, this is like a, a whole other program, I think, um, on on how we how we what we make illegal and how we make it illegal in the way we do things. Um, but the, the the fact of the matter is that there are uh, um, there's a there's a disproportionate number of young people, particularly young men, um, who are languishing in prison because um, you know they they had a small amount of comparatively small amount of marijuana. Um, uh, in their possession, or um, or were or were under the influence, uh, and you know, yet if they had been drinking in the park, 
um, and were blackout drunk, um, you know, they would have just been brought home and, and you know, allowed to sober up or thrown in the drunk tank overnight. Um, so there's, there's, we have a dis and that kind of brings us back to what we were talking about before. We have a disproportionate uh, response to those intoxicants. Um, I will say this, uh, hailing back to my band days, I was not a pot smoker. Um, uh, but most of the rest of the guys in my band were. Um, and uh, as the night went on, we play a three set night, as the night went on, um, they thought they were playing better and better. Um, uh, and I knew they were not, as a matter of <laughs> fact. Um, but they were sure that they were. Uh, and finally, after uh, about two years, I said, you know, you guys really, you, one time, just one time, um, I want one of you to say, stay straight with me during the course of a night and evaluate how we were playing as a band by the end of the night versus how we were playing at the beginning of the night when you guys went out on, you know, on set breaks and, and you know, and, and, and smoked up. Um, and uh, one guy who was actually probably the, uh, um, uh, the most uh, uh, um, frequent user of recreational marijuana um, decided to do that. He was a drummer. Um, and he came back and he said, um, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not smoking anymore, at least not while we were playing. He didn't smoke. Um, so, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it, it's, it's sort of as, as with alcohol. Uh, you know, and, and pretty much what Jim was saying at the beginning, you know, how many of you here would say, you know, I've made the best decisions of my life when I was drunk. You know, <laughs> I made the best decisions of my life when I was high, all right? Um, clearly, the, if you were to list the top 10 poorest decisions that you ever made, have you ever, and if you, and if you use recreational alcohol or marijuana, every single one of those things on your top 10 list is gonna be during one of those periods of time. Um, so, I mean, I think that sort of explains it all. All right. Any I, before we end, I want yes. to, you know. More recently, texting and driving became very similar to drinking and driving. So, before this, the end of this uh, get together, I think we should emphasize that I don't drink, but I used to text, <laughs> and uh, no more texting and driving because split second. And what happened to Amy's family would happen to my family or somebody else's family. So, and you're not under the influence of anything. Just you're taking your attention off your steering wheel. And I saw similar videos, shocking videos, about texting and driving. And it's, it's as horrific. And I would, I would guess the list of the worst 20 things you've ever, decisions you've ever made would include things that you put in a text. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> No, I don't know of any particular thing right now, although I'm not quite as in tune with the legislative side of what MAD does. Um, you, you know, the group in Tallahassee, you know. Um, I can say you can clearly see in statistics, um, if you look at drunk driving crashes, there are large metropolitan areas like New York City that actually have many fewer crashes because they have so much public transportation. Right, so you know, I believe public transportation of any type. Um, now, I will say, I think all those things are great. I would just be a cautious consu consumer. Um, you know, there are some people who say don't use Uber because they don't get background checked. And, you know, well, you know, just be cautious. You know, I'm a, a, a single woman. If I'm out on my own, I'm going to try to make a plan ahead of time that's very comfortable for me. If I'm with a group. Maybe I don't mind calling someone I don't know for a ride. Basically, a taxi or Uber or Lyft or anybody. Um, so yeah, I think public transportation of all those types really can be a, an effective tool. Um, but like anything else, just you know, be cautious. Um, and I, you know, it's all about the tax rolls and how much money is coming into the coffers of the cities. And you know, they have the existing structure with the taxis and. I, it's about money right now. Um, at some point, I think that will all just, especially with demand, will overwhelm that. Okay, so one last question, Chrissy. Well, Must be good. 
Sure. Um, you know, um, once a year um, at many places in the U.S., but in Central Florida, our Walk Like Mad is this coming Saturday at Lake Baldwin Park. It's kind of a nice walk around the lake in the Saturday morning. Um, if you come, you get to meet um, other families like myself. Several of us will have tables up. Um, there's free Dunkin' Donuts, coffee, donuts, and bagels, which is always a good reason to be anywhere. Um, some information about the victim services that are provided, uh, you know, music, and um, you know, we try to make it a um, kind of a fun gathering as we remember our families and loved ones and try to provide some outreach. And it is a fundraiser. Um, I will tell you, as someone who received services from MAD, I appreciate that those services were available for me. Uh, I mentioned our court process was two years. That's actually very quick. If you've never been in a court process, they can take much longer than that. And every, t every single hearing, my MAD victim advocate was there. When I couldn't be there, she was there and told me what happened. When I could be there, she met me at the door. She sat with me. She made sure I got back to my car okay. Um, she explained everything that was happening because that's part of their job, is to understand the court process. And as someone who had never been in a court process and was in one of the worst periods of my life, I needed that hand to be held. And that's part of why I continue to help with the fundraising arm. Um, is to be able to provide that for other families. Um, you know, we hope that one day we won't have to do any of this and we'll just fold and that will be just awesome. But until that day comes, you know, we keep trying to do all that outreach to help all the new people that come in. Um, and, you know, I still, my, our crash was in Pinellas County over in St. Pete. My cousin still lives there. And just this weekend, a young man who was a chef, married with a small child and a baby due next week, was actually killed as he walked out of, uh, they had he'd gone to a bar with a friend and he had not driven on purpose. He was just walking the couple blocks home and he and the friend were struck and he was killed. So unfortunately every day there's a new person to be helped. Um, but you know, feel free to come out and, and walk with us, you know, come see what's happening. Um, you can register at 8.30 and I think we're gonna walk starting about 9.30 in the morning. We, we walk by the dog park too, which is always one of my favorite parts. If you've never, if you have a dog and never been to Lake Baldwin Dog Park, it's kind of fun. So help me thank all the panelists for their insight.